Good morning, everyone. So welcome to again uh, another edition of this uh, Cyber Jagrukta Divas that we've been uh, uh, hosting for uh, around, I guess this is the third iteration and uh, it's probably going to continue for a few more iterations. Um, today we have with us uh, Mr. Saurav Raj. So just a very brief introduction to him. Uh, Mr. Saurav Raj is an IIT D alumnus and uh, he graduated uh, with a bachelor's degree from the Institute in 2004. He has then worked uh, extensively across the globe with the oil field giant uh, Schlumberger. He's also an alumnus of the prestigious uh, SPJ and FinTech program being the top of his class. He has uh, led several projects in the domain of human resources, learning management systems, as well as payroll. And uh, currently he's the head technology of uh, Settle First. It's an uh, initiative incubated under the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology at the STPI API Gurugram's Blockchain Center of Excellence. So this was a very brief introduction to Saurav. I'll, I'll just uh, hand over the podium to him for uh, uh, taking up everything from here. Over to you, Saurav. Right, so uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, Saurav, again, thank you for the uh, great and brief introduction. So I believe you've already taken care of the first part. So uh, rather than the 2000 and 2004, which we've already covered, I'll talk mainly about what is happening these days, uh, which is starting with fintech solutions in uh, in uh, with blockchain, and uh, that is also uh, the uh, the topic of discussion today. So we'll cover mainly with that, and uh, the format. Uh, if you have certain questions, uh, I would say let's uh, keep it. Uh, I'll, I'll pause in between. So before we switch uh, major uh, topics and themes during the presentation. Uh, so you can still ask them. So we have a little bit of context there also, right? So should be fine. We'll, I, I believe we should be in the chat as well. So uh, do leave your questions there and then we'll go through them. So talking about blockchain solutions and what we are doing, uh, this is since uh, last year. Uh, uh, so many of you would know your story if you are a little bit active in the startup space. Uh, so your story does a annual event where they shortlist a few startups uh, based on the relevance of the technology, the problem uh, uh, area that they are in and the uh, uh, the uh, impact of the solution. So we were one of those uh, top 30 selected last year. It was a uh, the annual event was sponsored by your story plus AWS. And our solution mainly was in the area of uh, identity management, which is personal data and identity management. Uh, using blockchain as a uh, tech underlying technology and, and i'll cover a little bit of that also uh, uh, later in the slide uh, this year itself some of the achievements uh, one bit sort of has already mentioned uh, which is uh, we're part of uh, the uh, first cohort of stpi S stpi stands for software technology parks of india uh, it, it's a program run by uh, ministry of information technology and uh, it's a very uh, you could say niche uh, focus areas uh, with uh, specific technology uh, domains, right? For example, there is one which has, which is only dealing with uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, something which is dealing with FinTech, it is based out of Chennai, uh, something which is dealing with medical sciences, there is one for electronic vehicles. So you could see all the uh, real cutting edge domain uh, of technology and uh, business applications, right? So we are part of the uh, blockchain center of excellence, which is based out of Gurugram. And the other notable achievement uh, uh, is specific to finance uh, and, and blockchain is that uh, we are also the winner of the, uh, the stellar uh, decentralized finance uh, applications. And, and this was uh, why it is also relevant is, uh, uh, is one because stellar is uh, one of the very early uh, blockchain companies uh, with, uh, with solutions uh, uh, present worldwide. And the second part of why it is also important is our solution was focused on how blockchain can benefit India, right? And and as we move ahead uh, toward the presentation, uh, uh, what we will talk about is, uh, see many applications you will see in blockchain uh, come to the fact that they're only POCs or very concept based and, and looks very good, very exciting, but the fact is it cannot be implemented, right? And, and there are practical reasons to do that, right? So. So having a solution which actually works, works in the Indian context and utilizes a technology 
uh, as as blockchain is is very uh, attractive in that sense right and we will see some of those uh, throughout rest of the uh, presentation discussion so moving on uh, this is a very good example it's uh, something which is out there and and well recognized so this is what i'll start with this is related to an earthquake which happened in in haiti right and this uh, it is quite unfortunate that in 2021 there is another earthquake in the same region and and it has caused a lot of uh, destruction and loss to life and property but the reason why i've picked this one it's almost 10 years old is for a very specific reason and, and, and you can see on the slide uh, a few things which are mentioned there and, and by the way this is available in public domain there are links here so you could go and actually read the entire article so earthquakes you would have seen floods we have seen in india and and, and it's 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 a natural calamity no one can predict it and, and as much as we try to do but it happens but most of the time even if we see it in the news and everywhere we see that what was the destruction loss to property loss to life so many lives lost, there are people in hospitals, there are uh, sometimes armies being called to uh, provide uh, uh, support and services for recovery, right? But we never see something like this where after, let's say, and uh, these are island countries, right? So after so much of damage has been done, now there has to be reconstruction, you know, people have to rebuild lives, communities, uh, uh, buildings and, and, and cities, right? What happens then? There's no record of who owns what. Right? So typically, if an entire, let's say, small island has been destroyed and, and you, know, you don't have any record of who owns which part of the island, then you can imagine what kind of a, a situation it will be. Like people can be fighting and there can be actual riots right, related to the ownership of the land itself. And this is typically what happened in, 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 in Haiti's uh, situation. Right? They wanted to build the land. There was a lot of government and international aid also available to do the reconstruction but the problem was who should get the money right and this is a very extreme situation i mean you have hundreds and thousands of people who, who are trying to rebuild their homes but no one knows where they should actually rebuild which part of the land which part of the area or the block of the city or or the uh, or the village actually belongs to them because there were no property rights those records computers, paper records, everything was destroyed in the earthquake itself. So now there is no ownership record, right? And what happens is then some, some, some things like mafias are now come in and they try to start uh, looting, right? And, and, and what happens is genuine uh, people who held the land, uh, poor, they, have, they now have no chance to you know, get what they actually uh, deserve. And, and this is a very uh, big political as well as a social uh, problem. And this is where one of the very early recognitions of how and if blockchain was a system which had existed and which held uh, the uh, records of uh, the ownership of the land of people, then even after such a uh, destruction where, uh, you know, your computer records are destroyed and uh, your, your paper records are destroyed, you could still go and identify who actually owned which piece of land and accordingly the, uh, the financial aid could have been given to them, right? So, so this is what is very interesting. Now imagine, and this is a purely hypothetical scenario, that you all have bank accounts with, for example, ABC Bank, right? And, and this is data is stored on uh, servers and, and multiple computers all across. And some of you already, already are from uh, uh, computer science, so you might be aware of how uh, this works. But imagine there is a virus attack uh, on, on, on that server farm, right? And, and what means is you can no longer access your data, which means the bank now cannot tell you how much balance you have in your account. And, and, and the data is destroyed, right? So very typical scenario, right? So out of so many people who have accounts at this bank do not know, and, and the bank cannot tell you what is your balance in your account. So let's say if you had, uh, you know, one lakh rupees, and, and now that you know, you could go and claim the bank that I had 100 black rupees in my account i had one crore what, what is there for the bank to say you you have you have it or you don't have it right so so these are the situations where a you could for any situation as as uh, technical or natural calamity you could lose an entire set of records and you cannot prove what actually belonged to you right 
so so this is where the primary uh, approach of what i will also take during rest of the presentation is to help us understand what actually the technology is and once we understand what uh, the technology is and what it can do you will see that the applications of it become much more easier to understand and and probably many people and many of these uh, examples that you uh, hear and see in the market uh, they don't become uh, possible is because of the underlying factor which i feel is people have somewhere missed what the technology is and what it can do right and there is a lot of craze around cryptocurrencies and bitcoins and everything and, and we'll talk about it but let us try to understand first what the technology is and what it can do actually right so so moving on it's it's a very basic standard introduction uh, the, this comes out of ibm's uh, documentation so uh, and, and ibm has been a very uh, uh, large player in the technology itself so so we can we can safely say we'll we'll go by that uh, definition so the three keywords here which i have highlighted so you can see blockchain is a shared that is the first shared it's a shared uh, resource second it's immutable and it's a ledger right and for recording what so recording two to three things right one is the transactions itself right so if i send someone or let's say alice uh, sends bob uh, you know 100 rupees it's a transaction it, it's recorded the second and most important thing is tracking assets right and and there's a definition of assets which i've written here and eventually building trust right and we will see what building trust also means so so this is where whenever you think of blockchain think of these six keywords right and and then it will make uh, the problem statement or anything which you're trying to solve using blockchain very very simple right so first is transactions right so transactions is 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 is, is anything it can be a financial transaction it can be transaction of data right which is where you know when we try to define what assets are so assets can be anything uh, for example your currency is an asset if you have a hundred rupee note in your hand it's it's a currency asset similarly a hundred dollar bill is an is an asset it's a currency asset your house is an asset your uh, grades in a particular semester are an asset your certificate which you got out of class 10 which you got out of class 12 uh, board exams now once you graduate and pass out of uh, your college and universities you'll get a degree that is an asset so typically anything is an asset which can have a value or a perceived value so so think of anything in those terms which can be there and there are some you could say non uh, quantifiable assets but we will not get into that so let us talk only about assets which can be quantified as having a certain value right and which can be exchanged right and then these get recorded you could simply say it's a database but i will avoid using the word database in very technical terms blockchain is not a database you should always call it a ledger and 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 there is a very big difference of why we don't call it a database versus we call it a ledger right so so let me give you uh, a basic introduction of a ledger versus database so when you go to a shop and in the olden days before all this technology and smartphones came uh, if you know uh, who someone who was running a shop you know what you would have seen is they would have a small notebook uh, which is also you know if uh, you know some traders right you know who are merchants right they would have a small book and they would keep writing every you know uh, trade they had every time they delivered uh, uh, you know items to someone else and every time they were owed money or they gave money and it was always an item and and if something was paid and cleared off they would cancel it a very typical scenario right even sometimes when you do our home finances we write all the bills that we have to pay and as we keep paying them we try to you know strike it off or cancel it and that typically is a ledger now the interesting concept to understand here is you can always write onto a ledger you cannot modify by saying well if i had a payment of rupees 100 to give to someone which i had written on the ledger day before yesterday today i cannot go and change that number to 50. i can make a second entry and this is where the difference is that I can make a second entry saying if I own person X hundred day before yesterday and today for some reason I owe him only 50, then I have to make a second entry. I cannot go and modify the previous entry. And if you can just imagine you're writing on a notebook, 
you cannot delete what you have written on the notebook. You can just write a second page. And that is typically what a ledger is. A ledger is an append only. You can only write to it. And of course you can read to it, but you can only write. There is no update and there is no delete. Versus in a typical database, and, and people from computer science will find it easy, but for the sake of uh, everyone in the audience, a database is where you typically have, you know, C, R, U, D, CRUD operations, right? Create, record, update, and delete. In a blockchain system, you only write, you only append. It's an, it's, that is why it's called an append only uh, setup. And that is why if you now, after this uh, session, after this discussion, you should never call blockchain a database. You should always call it a ledger because of this very principle definition, right? So it's always a ledger. And now because you see, you cannot go and change it and no one else can change it. It becomes immutable, which means once it is written, it is always there. And the second part of how it makes it immutable and, and trustworthy is because it is shared. Now, let me give you a very simple scenario. Let's say it, it's the same bank, this ABC bank where, where I go and have a, an account and it says I have a, a 10,000 rupees there. Tomorrow, let's say someone in the bank who doesn't like me, for example, goes and it's a database, right? They have, they go and change it from 10,000 rupees to say 100 rupees. So today when I log into my account, I see, well, my balance has gone. I have lost the money, right? And this is very scary, right? Now imagine if that database or that system of records which were there, which, which had the amount of my balance is now given to all of you. So of 110 participants in this uh, you know, seminar, every one of you had a record, a copy of that record, and it says, I have a balance of 10,000. So now imagine this bank agent, which was this rogue agent, let's say, it, he or she goes and changes my account to 100. And today I log in, I see, well, my account looks 100, but then I can go and ask 110 people who are on this, uh, uh, on this webinar, saying, what is my balance? So all of you will look at your version of, or your copy of this, this blockchain record and say, well, sort of your balance is uh, 10,000. It's not hundred. And that is where you see the power of how you could trust this data, right? There is one person who is now, we could say it's a rogue agent. He's saying my balance is hundred rupees versus there are 110 people who are saying this is 10,000. I think someone needs to go on mute. Uh, I'll just mute everyone and then maybe you can uh, unmute yourself. Sure. sure. Right, thank you. So, so this is where, so the basic of, of what a blockchain is, is based on these few very core principles, right? So now you saw that my record or this record of the bank of let's say it's a simple record it just has a name and uh, let's say a mobile number email address and the balance of this person right it is now spread over 110 people which means anyone who tries to say otherwise will not be accepted because you know we can go and check the 110 records and say that well the balance is this amount right and this is what it was and this is where this is the core concept of what a blockchain system is. This is the root of it. And everything else kind of builds on it, right? So it's a ledger, it tracks assets. And in this case, the asset is Indian rupees, right? And it's shared. And this is why it makes it difficult to implement a system like this, because now coming to the technology part of it a little bit, is why can you not just change anything you want in a blockchain system? Let's say if you are running a server, you know, and, and many of you would do in your projects and in your later lives when you go out, you're running a server, right? And you need to update something on the server. Well, it's your server. You could just go ahead and change anything you want, right? But now imagine there are 110 people running a copy of the server also and the copy of the data. So you cannot just update your own system and let everyone do what they are, what else they are doing. Because then you have a conflict on the network. So that is why upgrading a blockchain network, managing it, maintaining it is also a bit difficult. And that is why there is the, the implementation of the technology is not as easy as it sounds, right? And, uh, and, 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 and we'll talk about it a, a little bit later in the uh, presentation itself, right? So this is basically to understand what blockchain is, 
what at, at at the core of it it means and and now we'll start to see a little bit in more detail so i'll run through these things typically uh, this will go fast now because we have covered most of it so dlt versus blockchain so dlt is remember we talked about the share database the share ledger itself so dlt is just it is shared it's distributed a dlt is typically not a blockchain these are very two separate things right and and the key word again is unlike traditional databases which is your own database your own server like you know your institute might have a server and, and a database of all student records it's a it's a traditional centralized database right and, and dlts and blockchains do not have any a centralized functionality it is distributed right? immutable we talked about what immutable is and and how uh, it is uh, achieved in a practical sense smart contracts a very very interesting concept right so now if we take our uh, example a little bit further we said the data is now spread over 110 people for example yeah now imagine you have written a piece of a, a contract or a code right typically smart contracts are nothing more just think of it as simple a set of instructions or a code or a small computer program right many people will say oh there is a smart contract that is big but i'll try to simplify it for you make it less of a challenge to understand Think of it as a small computer program. It could be as simple as one plus two equal to three. But the, but the interesting thing about smart contract is now each of these 110 computers have a copy of that contract and they can execute it, right? So what means is in the practical sense, again, I'll go to the bank example. Let's say when you go to a bank, you know, most of the banks, what will happen is, or, or your Paytm app or phone pay or any, any, any kind of app, which is there, if you want to make a payment to someone, you go click pay and the, and the amount gets transferred instantly, right? And that is how all of them are expected to operate, right? And, and the person on the other side, at some point of time, will receive the funds. Now, imagine if, let's say Diwali is gone, but let's say Christmas is coming, right? And you want to send uh, some money to your friends or family or Christmas or New Year, right? But you know that you will be traveling and you are going to some mountains or uh, ocean side and then you may not have the best of signal connectivity, but you still want those people to receive money, right? So you give your bank a set of instructions, right? That, you know, on, on uh, 24th of uh, December, send everyone, these are, these are my 10 contacts, send them 100 rupees each, right? Very simple. And, and here is the interesting thing. Let's say on 24th morning, the server of the bank goes down because, you know, so many people have entered their, you know, this wish list of sending a little bit of, uh, you know, gift coupons or money to their uh, friends and family and, and so on, right? Or for some reason, there is a guy who goes and up upgrades a patch and, you know, this program which was there, it's not working now, right? So now you have suffered because of a centralized system which existed in place cannot execute uh, your you know transaction of sending 100 rupees on the eve let's say 6 pm on a 24th uh, december evening right and, and and that's pretty bad it, it's it's not a great situation for you and, and for the bank itself now Opposite to having this on a single server, on a single computer. Now, let's say if this was distributed, right? 110 computers each have a copy of this contract and each have this transaction. And they know that they have to execute this, run this program of making this transfer at 6 p.m. on 24 December. Now, let's say one of those servers is this server from this bank, which goes down. But out of those 110, now 109 are still working right which means at 6 pm your transactions of sending 100 rupees to 10 contacts will still happen because all of these other computers which are still working one of them will pick up the uh, transaction and they will execute it right so now you see this becomes the blockchain where we understand we we all knew about it bitcoins and cryptocurrencies but now you see if you just look at the technology what it can do it is a very good and excellent application of failovers right servers going down systems going down systems not accessible you know when there is a lot of load and rush on, on these systems if they switch to something else with, with blockchain as the underlying technology and infrastructure you see these systems will never go down and and where do we need this system there are 
some very critical public infrastructure, for example, uh, a record of all hospitals, how airlines travel, how trains run. These cannot be on a centralized systems which can go down because it will cause mayhem. Even as basic as running your traffic lights in a, in a city, right? You might have seen some movies and all where, you know, some hacker has gone and, you know, changed, uh, uh, you know, the security light, uh, you know, typical James Bond movies or, you know, some other these action movies, these things happen, right? But because it's a single central computer, right? And they go and they change it. But if that code and program was running on a blockchain based system and infrastructure, the hacker has no chance now. Even if he brings down one computer, there are a lot of these other computers and machines, which are typically called nodes. They are running, right? So you cannot bring down public infrastructure as important, which is vital to uh, the society itself, right? So, so this is where if you just think about blockchain and you understand these few basic concepts, you will see how and where it can be applied, right? And then the use cases come. Then you understand uh, what the problem is, is what typically is what we're trying to solve and how we can solve it, right? So, so this was about smart contracts. Uh, trust, we have already talked about this because no one trusts anyone, but the way the technology is deployed and built, we know that if something is written on blockchain, it cannot be changed, right? So that is where uh, is trust is there. And of course, the fact that you can go and verify all the records, right? And, and this is very interesting. Uh, to understand that now we said that it's an append only ledger. For example, in a typical database or a program or application, uh, what happens is, you know, like we said, you're, if it's an account balance, it will always override the account balance and update it. Right. But if it's a blockchain based system, every time your account balance gets updated, there is a new record created and you will read the last data, right? Saying if, if, if Saurav's account balance was reading 10,000 yesterday and I have made, uh, let's say, 100 rupees of transaction today, today it's reading 9,900, that's a new entry. It's not an update. So you have two records of the same account balance for the same individual, so which means these are massive databases, right? But at any point of time, I can go back in history and I can identify exactly what the balance was. When you've updated it, unless you maintain a log, you will never know what data existed at which point of time. So you don't have any history. You just have what it reads today, right? So this is where there's some key technology differences of you know, using traditional systems versus blockchain-based systems. And security, like we just talked about, the, the, the manner in which it's, it's implemented and uh, deployed, it, it makes it very difficult for someone to come and hack it, right? But then you would say, you know, so many hacks happen. But that's not because of the blockchain itself, but the way it's implemented. I mean, imagine you have your own house, you put a lock on it, but then you leave the key under the carpet, right? And someone, you know, Samne, the shopkeeper, he's looking at it and he knows that, well, Mr. Sharma is leaving every day, whose keys are, uh, you know, below the uh, doormat. Well, it's a security breach, right? It's a security flaw in your own system design. Not that, you know, your lock is bad, right? So this is where most of the systems have failed in blockchain is because the because the application built on top has security flaws. And, and talking on security, there is uh, another interesting thing, which I'm not sure if we'll have the time today. It's called 51% uh, attacks, right? And, and those are separate and probably, uh, you know, we could discuss it separately. I've not taken the time to add it today, but 51% attacks are very interesting. Those were happening in the early days of blockchain, where people, again, human, we, ourselves, all of us, give it or not, we are, we are greedy people. That's that's a simple story, right? We are greedy. If we have one unit of something, we want 10 units of something. It, it's as simple as that. We have money. We always want more. Everyone wants more money. That's it. So so to briefly cover, we talked about, you know, 110 com computers versus one computer going bad, right? Now imagine out of those 110, if 56 computers went rogue, which means now they control the entire network because they are in popularity. I mean, they are more in number, right? Similarly, you know, if the it is just if you could just think of it as pure democracy, right? Is the best example of a technological implementation of democracy, right? If if one network is right, if one node is correct, and hundred nine are saying something else, well, that that is the decision that wins, right? So that is where uh, it's a point about security. 
and and then about types of blockchain network so you know of course there are the public networks they're private and they are some hybrid models right so public is simple it's available to everyone for example the bitcoin network the ethereum stellar ripple uh, solana cardano these are these are public networks right anyone can go join make a transaction create an account transfer funds to anyone in the world right so these are public right private are you know your instances for example if your institute implements a blockchain system for managing your uh, you know student records and everything it becomes a private and of course they could extend the functionality to someone outside to come and verify it right so that could be one and of course consortiums are kind of somewhere in the middle where it can be both private public combined uh, different model of structure and how things are implemented right right so last topic before we switch gears is a uh, is a little bit on cryptography i think there's a little bit spelling mistake here so cryptography it's about security it's very important uh, and of course we are talking about cyber security also this is the entire theme so i've kept it here because i've talked to many students also and sometimes uh, you know try to understand i mean the technology language java javascript all that stuff we talk about but i always ask them a question of what they understand about security right and, and uh, typically in the context of uh, digital security, online security, uh, data protection and those kind of things, right? So, so here is the thing, there, there are two things interesting about security, right? And, and if you allow me, sort of, can I, uh, let's say, ask a question, uh, people can respond. Sure, sure, the, sure. Yeah? it's all up to you. You are the, you are the boss. Oh, <laughs> I wish it was me, but, but okay, here, here is the case, right? So in your chat, I want, uh, everyone how do i access the chat here okay is this one um okay so so if if you all could take a minute and write what is the difference between encryption and hashing so anyone who has an idea what is encryption and someone who could write what is hashing just just write in the chat you know just take a minute and 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 add your comments we already have a lot of uh, uh, queries going on in the chat i'm just trying my best to uh, ah, okay. resolve them but uh, yeah we'll uh, don't worry guys we'll uh, we'll uh, you know i'll i'll expect uh, that sort of might might come back with us someday and uh, you know they probably give us another talk uh, right okay, we, we are just yeah. trying to cover the basics today right 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 and i see some very interesting comments actually we should do a more of these but, but let's see so okay so great i i see people are replying so how do I, I cannot make this bigger. Ah, okay. So here is uh, something who's, uh, okay. So Adya says encryption produces different size of encrypted data in the end. Sura says encrypted data can be converted back to original. Hashing can be converted. Very good, Sura. Um, encrypt means to secure data. This is from Kamlesh. Excellent, Kamlesh. Very good. Again. Abhay says hashing is to create a hash code and encryption is to encrypt that data and get data or information. Partly correct and, and uh, we'll talk about it what, uh, in bit detail. Hertz says hashing provides some hash value. Adya says but in hashing end production's data size is constant. Excellent Adya, that is correct. Uh, Hertz says encryption turns into coded language but it in predictable manner. Hertz, that is also very correct. Okay, so good. So very good responses. And 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 uh, based on this, uh, both convert data to different forms. Correct, Uday, and that is also correct. So okay, so I'll go back. Most of you have uh, understood, and and you you you're almost correct, right? And uh, so in simple sense, encryption is something which locks the data, and it can be decrypted, which means you can get the original data back. As, as simple as that, right? So encryption is a two-way process. You can encrypt data. And you can decrypt to get it back. For example, between my application, let's say banking application, which I access on my uh, smartphone or mobile phone or uh, internet banking, to the bank server, data is encrypted. Which means if I'm making a transaction, the software will encrypt the data here, transfer it over the internet, and then decrypt on the server side to execute it. And this is essential by it is needed. Now the second is hashing, which is only one way you can only hash a certain uh, parameters certain uh, inputs but you can never retrace and find the original input back which some of you have mentioned so that is exactly correct 
so encryption is two way hashing is always one way right so now the question is how do you know then you, you hashed a certain input for example Saurabh has a uh, hundred rupees right you hashed it but how do you know Saurabh has hundred rupees so in this hashing what you can do is you can always go back and input the original parameters so if and, and you can do a check on it right so if you hashed Saurabh has hundred rupees and you create got a hash value now to I, now you can verify if Saurabh had hash Saurabh had 100 rupees or he did not have 100 rupees that is the only thing which you can do so you put this thing again into the hash function you get an output and if you compare these two values you know that my input was correct and that is what so what it means is from a security standpoint you don't know what the actual data is no one can find it out only if you trust someone they will put the same parameters and they will compare and then they will know that this was the correct input right so for example, if I hash one plus two, or let's say if I hash a string of numbers, right? So one, two, and three, and I send it, it produces a hash. But how do I know the hash is correct? Again, I have to tell you, I pushed one, two, and three, and you will pass it the same hash function, and then you will get the same hash. So you know, the input was one, two, and three. But if you don't know the input of input was one, two, and three, you will never know what the original data was, right? So which means, you have been able to protect your data. Now, for example, where could you use this, right? It's a very good concept, but what's the practical use of it, right? So for example, now, let's say, you know, talking again in financial systems, these are protected, password protection, so many of these things, right? So you do know that your passwords are never kept in the same form. Even it cannot be encrypted because then someone who has control of the server can go and decrypt it because they have the encryption keys and the encryption parameters, right? So that is why passwords are always hashed. So which means as soon as you enter your password in your internet banking or any system application or mobile phone, the, the browser itself, the first interface itself before it hits the server will put that password through the same hashing function and it creates an output and then it will send that hash to the backend server to check if this is the same password. And if those two hashes will match, then you know that you have put the correct password and then it will allow you entry into the system. Now, this is very much typical, it happens. Now, how do you use it to protect your data in the physical world? Now, for example, I tell you that, you know, you have various classrooms, right? And, and each one of them uh, require, for example, some sort of, and then let's say there is no teacher and, you know, because of COVID, uh, you're, you're having a remote session and there is a very futuristic scenario, right? So all these classrooms are now digitally locked, right? And of course, if you don't are, if, if you're not present in a particular classroom, you cannot go there. So what you do is at the door, you have to enter your mobile number, for example, to see if you are registered in that classroom, right? Now, one scenario is you have to enter your mobile number and let's say two people can have same mobile number, which definitely does not happen, but let's say you have to enter your date of birth also. Now, mobile number and date of birth. Now, this has become something personal information, right? Which is typically when you try to verify yourself, you have to provide it. Or let's say even better scenario is it tells you to provide your Aadhaar number. Now, Aadhaar number is very, very personal, right? It's your personal data. It's your identity data. You don't want anyone else to use it, right? Now, if the system was designed in a way that it is taking that Aadhaar data and taking the same thing to the backend server to check, now that's a bit risky right because in the process in the middle if a hacker is sitting there he or she can anticipate and capture your other data so your other data is gone to some other party again this other data is going to the server it might be stored in some database now if someone gets control of the database which means he or she has all the records of names other card numbers and everything and this is where you hear of the popular breaches of where you know uh, data has been leaked world over and there are some very good examples of this it is because of this information right so alternative to this is let's say at the source itself at the point of entry your aadhaar number was hashed with a certain function right and there are many popular functions so what you get now is a random string of numbers you don't you're not storing or transmitting your aadhaar card you're only transmitting the hash of the Aadhaar card, your Aadhaar card number. And that is the number which goes and it gets compared in the backend database. 
so while it will verify that yes this is the correct aadhar number and you know for example uh, uh, person uh, a has come to join this class yes he should be admitted or she should be admitted but what you see in this alternative scenario i did not send the aadhar card number over the network or even to the back end database so now any hacker who comes and who is trying to anticipate the traffic in between or trying to you know capture the database and get control of the database itself and leak records he will have no idea of who this aadhar card number belongs to so while cyber security is very important for for us from a consumer standpoint most of us are in the technical domain or if, or even in the non technical domain but some of you will go ahead and will start building this systems will become uh, you know great and good developers and you know do great things but this is where you have to think of how you end up protecting your customers data and if you can do that well your company your itself your brand's reputation will be very very high today it is less about what else you can do with your application but it is more about how important and how better you are protecting your customers data while it may not give you money or you know business businesses will not earn by saying that i am hashing your you know data and i am keeping it secure but the downside of it is very huge businesses can lose a lot of reputation and a lot of value overnight if their data gets hacked because the moment you know that some company cannot protect your data online you will leave it and if if customers leave a company or any business any product it will crash it's simple so that is why it is very very uh, important to understand these hashing functions this cryptography uh, underlying technology systems and how it actually uh, gets implemented right and 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 i'm very happy that your institute this uh, uh, you know and, and the team behind it uh, saurav is here uh, they are doing this session because as we go from here as we go beyond now in the future things are going to get more digital more easy to access which also means uh, it is going to be presenting us with far greater risks than we had before in previous times when you would go you would you would show your aadhar card or uh, voter card or driver license physically you know there used to be security guard sitting there he would look at it most of the time that guy knows you because you are generally coming to the same building to the same so there was a trust there right now because of covid and everything things have changed now you cannot have that physical contact you have to enter your passwords digitally touch pads you know whatever voice control systems which means everything has become digital so if you are not able to protect it a at your side b as a developer as a system designer as a as an architect of these technological systems if you cannot do it you will be in a much greater risk not today but tomorrow right and there are so many breaches if you just go india may be breaches hota hai it is here also it is outside also world over and it's a big big risk to anyone right so i'm hopeful there are many more sessions like this where you will learn more about the technology aspect of it uh, as respect with respect to security itself uh i think we are running out of time so i'll cover some of the uh, financial use cases which i had actually wanted to cover right so give me about quick few seconds uh <clears throat> so so here now talking about blockchain and financial services now this is a great slide this is actually taken from mckinsey this was published several years back in the very early days of blockchain and actually there is a link here i once i share the presentations you can look at it so so what it shows is this graph is interesting is you see on the on the bottom axis it says feasibility is is you know how easily we can implement it versus on the vertical side you see the impact from low impact to a high impact right and and i put the numbers and the the the, the respective use cases on the side right so on the top you see at number 1 is trade and supply chain finance right now why it is important is is we'll cover in the in the following slide some of these cases uh next you have transactions monitoring uh third and fourth uh cross border payments p2p is peer to peers person to person and uh, b2b is business to businesses so businesses making uh, you know settlement of invoices payments and you know uh, things like that peer to peer is typically what you do with your uh, you know uh, one person to another person very popular and this is where most of the cryptocurrency has been right making uh, payments from one person to the other and the fact that it makes it very easy 
verifiable instant settlements and so on right when i mean today technology has improved but just about even two years back you know you send a you know payment or you know your 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 from your home you know you're getting your fees paid it would be like you go to the bank you you put the transaction in you submit it and 24 hours or 48 hours later you still have to call the bank or someone has to call or, or you know you'll discuss over the phone or you'll go to your teller and ask you you know you, you did you get the money or not right so today we have come far far ahead from those systems there are the instant confirmations instant settlements right which are happening and that is the benefit of using blockchain as a technology right again number seven uh, there is micro payments now what happens is there's always a cost to make any transaction right and for a business to be viable or any business to be viable uh, your cost of well let's say what you earn should be a little bit greater than uh, your cost of uh, actually doing it right so you know for making a transfer from between one party to the other there's a cost involved but the bank has it they're not charging you it's different that's one thing but there's always a cost because you have to run servers you have to have people you have to have systems computers offices buildings everything so all of these add up to cost right why does the school you know ask you for fees it is because the infrastructure teachers everyone who comes is a cost right and that cost has to come from somewhere if the school wasn't making a little bit of profit to make it keep running it wouldn't be able to be there and it wouldn't be able to give you uh, the lectures right so you have to think of it while we expect things to be free in the actual world the, the best and the, the the best version of the truth is don't expect things for free because it never is right so to cover the cost if you like something be happy to pay for that guy for the service or whatever so that guy can do a better job and that is the best way you can keep this thing running why people like us and us is very popular and, and one of the best uh, examples of uh, commerce in the world is because they understand this much better yes people ask for free stuff but they know that if you are into business you have to help the transaction happen you have to help the other guy so he can do a better job if you're in a business scenario you want services at a cheaper rate but if you squeeze your vendor or your supplier too much then he might be running out of business and tomorrow he's out of business so you have to go and find another vendor or another supplier right so you see if you squeeze too much if you try to get things for free eventually it wouldn't work right so that is why that cost is there and for micro payments why it is more important is if the cost of making a transfer is so high that you cannot recover it then you cannot do these micro payments right and today micro payments are a big chunk right upi why it is so popular is is actually it could implement micro payments right you could transfer 10 rupees and it will still go NEFTs and these are, you know, many of them you see you have minimum transaction limits. You want to do RTGS, it has to be above 6 lakh. Because of the way it is done in the back end, it needs a certain minimum cost to cover the expenses of doing it, right? So payments and, and it was one of the earliest forms of what blockchain can be used for. It's very popular, easy to understand and that is why it became very famous. So you had Bitcoin. In fact, it was the first application of blockchain which came into the real world. And, and please don't ask me who Satoshi is. No one knows. I wish someone knew. So, and that is where it started. And, and Bitcoin is an implementation of blockchain. So based on what you have learned today, uh, two things should become clear that Bitcoin is not blockchain. Cryptocurrency is not blockchain. But Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are assets. And assets which are transferred, tracked, traded, exchanged using blockchain as an underlying technology. Right? This is what we understood. And some of the other use cases that you see are, of course, in lending, where you could also lend and create a smart contract. For example, today, if you ask someone who has taken a loan from a bank, right, it could be a housing loan, it could be a student loan, it could be a loan for a personal reason, it could be a loan for a reconstruction of a house or anything for that matter, or even traveling abroad, right? Today, people are getting loans for traveling, right? And what happens is once you take a loan, you have an EMI and you have a certain duration to pay, right? So many times what you will do is you will sign up an ECS, right? Which is, you know, automatic clearing, you know, every month the EMI is deducted from your account. Now, this is what happens. Now, when you implement it in a blockchain based system, it could be very similar to the example that we talked about sending 100 rupees on the eve of Christmas, right? So typically your ECS, in a way, it's a smart contract, just that it is not a blockchain smart contract, right? Because every month your account is deducted with the AMI amount and deposit to the bank, right? 
So that is a simple relation of how a smart contract could work. Now, private equity is a very interesting case, uh, and and I'll mention it just here because uh, you know you do share trading, right? And some of you might know even if you don't do it, shares are there in the open market, right? So you could think of the shares as an asset of the company itself, which represent a portion of ownership within the company. And these are typically shareholders, right? If, if you understand it. And in the beginning, we made it clear that blockchain can be used to track and transfer assets. So for example, very recently Zomato uh, uh, went uh, public, right? IPO, and they released, uh, they came into the small stock market and they released so many shares people were able to buy those shares and by virtue of buying those shares they have a little bit of ownership in the company of course it is not great that they can influence the company but they have small bit of ownership now those shares can be distributed using a blockchain system which means now if you have to go and tell anyone that i own shares of a certain company uh, for example zomato in this case here is the record and the company cannot change that it is publicly available so your shareholding records could be there now what happens is in a smaller sense come to it now let's say you start you 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 have a startup and and you are very initially you you have free few employees came uh and and then you want to give them shares right now you're not so big as a zomato or a paytm or was uh, you know ongcs or air indias or these indigos and big companies uh, of the world so you will get listed on the stock company but if you were to uh, record this information on a blockchain and tomorrow let's say some of the founders you know they come together and they say well we'll throw this guy out and we'll take over all his shares now if that case was recorded on blockchain so then you know this guy you know you cannot uh, uh, cheat him out of his shares right and if you were that guy then you know your your interest and your value and you know your ownership in that company is secured right so this is where from from a very small use case to helping an individual guy to a use case which is affecting billions of people, right? The technology can cover both ends of the spectrum, right? And this is where the power of the underlying technology is, right? And some of the other cases, for example, invoice dispute, it again comes in uh, trade and uh, supply chain, it's business to business. Uh, and, and the one which is sitting at number six is KYC AML, which is, which is a very interesting thing. An example of uh, that we covered earlier when we were talking about how you could authenticate yourself uh, using uh, information where your data is not transferred over the network, not even sent to the backend, but using good cryptography, good programming, good setup, good architecture, you could build those systems. Right? I'll take a quick stop here. I'll ask uh, Sora if you have time because it's almost uh, uh, 12 or 3 uh, by my time. Uh, yeah. Uh, so maybe a couple of more minutes we can we can just uh, wrap it up if it is possible. Okay, sure. We, we can, we can have you again if, if you are free. You know, we are always all ears. <laughs> uh, we, we can have you again. Sure, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Okay, so uh, okay, so I'll take the last five minutes and then we can have some a uh, little bit of Q and A. So I'll skip this now. Compared to cri uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, it's banned in India and you know there is a lot of discussion which goes on and there is a new parliament bill but uh, hear me this and uh, uh, say this uh, don't get worried that you wouldn't have cryptocurrency or the government wouldn't allow cryptocurrency the benefit of cryptocurrency is based on all the factors that we talked about right it's faster settlement instant it can be verified on those things now an implementation of the cryptocurrency for practical purposes is a central bank digital currency and and after this you should go and, and and research these things a little bit you'll you'll gain more knowledge out of it so a central bank digital currency in the very simple sense what it is is your indian rupees in a digital form and, and that's as simple as it can be right for example if you say bitcoin it's a digital currency no one has a bitcoin coin actually in hand right or bitcoin as a note right there's not a hundred bitcoin note but you have a hundred rupees note so a central bank digital currency will be a digital money you just have an account balance you don't have physical paper in your hands or a physical coin in your hand and that's it now the difference between a cryptocurrency and a and a stable uh, or sorry a, a central bank digital currency is this is regulated which means the value of this if you have 100 rupees today the value of 100 rupees remains stable over time which means if it's today 100 it will be 100 tomorrow most likely 
a cryptocurrency can, can be 100 bitcoin today the value of it can go let's say one bitcoin is a random number 100 rupees today the value of that bitcoin one one bitcoin could go from 100 rupees today to 10 rupees tomorrow which means you have lost money no one wants that so while now you've understood this when you think of cryptocurrencies think there is always a risk with cryptocurrency like there's a risk in stock market right stocks can go but it does not fluctuate so much let's say if you invested heavily in a stock and that company goes down becomes bankrupt goes out of business you lose the entire value so cryptocurrency is exactly that cryptocurrency is not something for you to hold today think of it as an investment class and think of it as a risk instrument it has a value of something today it can go down in value and of course it can go up in value as well there are both sides to it so i'm not against cryptocurrency i'm just trying to tell you that understand what it is right and you will make a better decision so central bank digital currencies here's a quick snapshot uh, you can find this online also uh, there's so many countries including india there are talks it's just that the government needs to see how best it can be implemented now when you talk about currencies and on all of this have this thought in consideration that the government typically or the people who are trying to implement and build the system they're not worried about people like you and me i would say we all should consider ourselves a little bit privileged because imagine this we are sitting communicating via internet we have these facilities we each have computers smartphones everything we are technically and technologically able people right but the government has to worry about the 90 million people or the 90 percent of the people who do not have access to fancy computers smartphones light electricity food water every day have a bank balance that they don't have to worry about i mean you and i we can go order zomato swiggy i mean we can do ten thousand things we can shop on amazon flip cards do everything but the moment you step outside of your campus you will find so many people who do not have access to those kind of uh, luxuries i would say right and the government is the only person who could think of those when it comes to having a currency which can work uh, having to build an infrastructure and public systems which will work for them and this is where today you might feel that the government is not letting you buy cryptocurrencies or cryptocurrency is banned or you cannot have bitcoin or you cannot have this currency or coin imagine that it is not for you it is for those people to be able to survive right it is for those people to be able to live right so that is where and that is why some of these things take time so have patience this thing will come and if you can understand and you know educate others also and what this is you will see this technology will bring a lot of value right so finally leaving with you with few core concepts uh, for any digital system like we said there are two to three things one the first one is your identity itself what it is what it is not the second is what is the sort of contract and agreement you have which defines the rules of engagement right you say i want to give you 100 rupees if you give me this that's your contract you have an agreement with your with your institute saying you teach me so many courses i'll give you this much money it's an agreement pure and simple right so you your school knows who you are you you know who the school is right you have an agreement that you know they will uh, they'll teach you you'll pay the fees and that's it and then at the end there's a transaction which is to record that you actually made the transfer and everything in the world everything around you now if you think on these three terms you will understand what actually it is everything is a transaction end of the day it can be transaction of value it can be transaction of data it can be transaction of some asset for example when you when when a builder is you know, building houses and selling it right so you know who the builder is the identity is there you know who the person who's buying it there is an agreement in place saying you know i will complete the building in so much time and give it to you and of course you have to make payments towards it school education buying a ticket buying a movie ticket everything is a transaction which involves these three core concepts identity of the parties the agreement on how the transfers of asset should be done and finally the actual transfer of the asset so i'll, I'll close it at this point uh, rest of the slides i believe we can uh, we'll cover it a little bit later or maybe in a follow-up session and uh, let's uh, see if we have some uh, questions and all right i believe uh, we can spend yeah, five actually minutes we have a lot of them and uh, guys we can probably you know some of you can probably unmute and ask a couple of questions uh, uh, we are we are we are already you know over we have basically we have been overwhelmed to be honest uh, with the with the response and uh, uh, you know everyone wants to uh, listen to you more it's just that we have time constraints and we can't 
uh, yes. and go on for long. But maybe a couple of questions. Anyone who would like to unmute and ask, uh, we can we can probably have it. Sure. So I guess uh, most of them are are prefer are preferring to chat. Yeah, there is someone here. Go ahead. Yes, sir. I I I want to talk about uh, like NFC tokens. NFT tokens. Yeah. NFT, NFT tokens. Very yeah. interesting concept. <laughs> so her. So let me tell you what in simple sense to understand NFT is. Uh, let's say, in case of you, uh, NFT is non fungible token uh, versus if it's non fungible, which means there is something which is fungible. Fungible means you can divide it. For example, your hundred rupee note, you can actually divide it to one rupee notes, right? So you can have one as the minimum, right? But you know, you can go to PESA as well. So what happens is your currency is fungible. You can divide it into smaller assets. The second is the way you look at currency, it can be unique. A hundred rupees is hundred rupees, right? It can be with anyone and you can say, well, it still is hundred rupees. But if you say I have a hundred rupees with this particular number, right, then it becomes a unique asset. That hundred rupee note becomes unique. So it becomes non fungible, right? So when you come to non NFT tokens, uh, token is just a word which is like, you know, it's tokenized, right? Uh, which means it's a unique small unit, but non fungible means it cannot be broken down further, right? And it's unique. So these are the two properties which define it. So for example, a uh, piece of art, right? I have the basic grasp of uh, NFT. I just right. wanted to know, like how to link it with like some of my digital art or something. You know, it's right. right. So what you do in that sense is uh, you create a digital twin of it. You record it uh, in a in a blockchain based system. There are NFT marketplaces today, and then when someone buys it, you transfer the ownership of that digital asset, which is the NFT token, to the individual. Right. And that's again, like we said, it's an asset. So if you go back to the basic principles, now your NFT is an asset. You created it and based on certain transaction, if someone buys your asset, you have transferred it to someone else, right? And it's a digital representation of anything which exists in the physical world. So for example, your art could be NFTs, your degree certificates could be NFT, right? Which means it's now presented digitally and it's all recorded on blockchain. So if you are going for higher studies, let's say you go to Harvard, or Stanford, you know, for your PhDs and all, you could say that, well, my institute gave me my degree certificate. It is on NFT here. You can go and verify it, right? So that is how NFTs could work. Okay. So, so I guess, uh, thank you everyone. And uh, uh, probably we are, we, I know we should have had a longer uh, duration for the talk. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time today. Um, I will try my best to, uh, you know, persuade Saurabh to uh, be with us one more time at least. And, uh, you know, talk to everyone. You guys seem to be uh, enjoying the talk. And this is all um, an initiative to basically, as I said, it's Cyber Jagarupta Divas. So the idea is to uh, make more people aware of uh, technology as well as uh, things related to cyber security. So thank you, you know, please uh, join me to thank uh, Saurav for uh, this wonderful session. Uh, Saurav, we look forward towards uh, having you probably once more. Uh, we'll just uh, talk out how we can do that. But uh, please, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'd, I'd like to uh, express our sense of gratitude towards you. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you again uh, to everyone out there. Uh, we could not cover a lot of things, but uh, this is a start and, and I hope uh, in the last one hour or so, I was able to give you a brief idea of how and what the technology is. And, and I'm hopeful that now that you understand a little bit, you will also go and research uh, and read online stuff, uh, things about it. There's a lot of this. But with this information, hopefully it clears out a lot of confusion. And uh, of course, if you have questions, uh, send it to Saurabh sir. He can send it to me and, uh, uh, you know, and then we can take it from there. Right. So have a good, uh, you know, rest of the day. Be safe online. That's uh, my only request to you and, uh, and, and do well. Right. Thank you again. Best of luck. Okay. Thank you, Saurav. Thank you, everyone. Bye.